very, very much. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, uh, Frank uh, Nagel is soon going to give uh, some very, very interesting results from, uh, uh, from the research, but we thought it'd be very useful to first uh, give a little context here. So I'm going to try to do that now. Uh, hopefully most of you already know what open source software is, but some people I think still have misunderstandings. So quickly, we're talking about open source software or free and open source software, which is software licensed to users with specific freedoms. Run the program for any purpose, study, modify, freely redistribute, either the original or modified version. Uh, you can see the open source initiatives, open source definition for more. There's a number of widely used licenses that are open source licenses listed here, MIT, Apache, BSD3 clause, uh, LGPL, GPL. If you've got software, but it's not open source software, what do you call it? Uh, it's typically cause, called either closed source or proprietary software. Um, if you ever work particularly with, with governments, it's often very useful to understand that open source is a kind of commercial software. Um, it's licensed to the general public. Um, an important aspect of these open source licenses is that they enable worldwide collaborative development of software. And that has remarkable positive properties, at least the, it enables a lot of positive results. Open source software is a critical part of today's software supply chain. Uh, Synopsys recent study found that 98% of code bases in general and of Android applications specifically contained open source software. Um, uh, one study that they did found that 70% of code bases were open source software, even if the entire application wasn't. And that's just one study from Synopsys. Another one from Sonotype found 90%. So anywhere from 70 to 90%, depending on exactly the data sets you're analyzing. And the use is increasing. You can see from the graph from the right, uh, the growth is just extreme, uh, increasing and increasing and increasing. Um, in fact, even back in 2019, Sonotype noted that they've seen double, triple digit growth, no slowdown in sight. Well, that's great in terms of functionality, but what that has, um, has unfortunately yielded is a lot of projects and organizations really don't know what's in their systems. They use components that then use components that then use components. and you know, in the end, there's some component in Nebraska that nobody knows about, but in fact, your entire modern digital infrastructure depends on. So we're gonna be talking specifically about security. And one uh, myth that I wanna immediately um, uh, explode is this word always. I'm sure many of you will realize that always is a, is a rare situation. Um, is open source software always more secure? Is proprietary software always more secure? And the answer really is neither. Um, now, it is true that open source has a potential security advantage. Uh, if you look at the basic secure design principles that were identified back in the 70s, they're still valid today. Uh, one of them is called the open design principle, uh, which basically says protection mechanism must not depend on attacker ignorance. Now, open source better fulfills this principle, so it, that gives it a potential advantage. And I've always been perplexed by people who say that peer review can't work or what's called many eyes theories. Uh, this is perplexing to me because it's how the rest of society works. Academia, science, math, engineering, all depend on peer review. That's how it works. So the notion that peer review somehow is useless for software doesn't make any sense. Uh, but it is true that just being able to be peer reviewed is not the same as having actual re review or have reviewers who know what to, to look for. Um, yeah, no, mo no software is perfect. Vulnerabilities may be found even in well-run projects. That said, continuous careful review is more likely to find vulnerabilities and fix them and get rid of them over time. So let's put some context here. Um, the Open Source Security Foundation is a cross-industry collaboration. Uh, it's part of the Linux Foundation. Its purpose is to improve the security of open source software by building an expert community. Um, it was established late 2020. Um, we uh, switched over to a member-funded model late 2021. Um, and it has a huge, huge number of folks involved. Here are the premier members, quite a long list. Um, 
Here are the general and associate members. This is not just one or two organizations getting together. This is a large number of folks across the software industry working together to improve security. I can't possibly cover all the things that the OpenSSF is doing. There's no one magic answer. Many things need to be done. And the OpenSSF project has a huge number of projects. Uh, one of them, if you look on this eye chart here, Q, Harvard study. That's what we're going to be talking about today. We're, we're looking to ident help identify critical projects. And the reason is not all open source software projects are equal. A small subset are of, of special importance. Um, the census, too, that Harvard's going to be talking about today um, in, this, in the context of OpenSSF is actually un, uh, within the uh, Securing Critical Projects Working Group. Um, and uh, you know the working group is then going to take this data and other data to create an updated list of uh, critical open source software projects. It already has a draft list. Uh, the best practices working group within the OpenSSF uh, has already been distributing multi-factor auth um, authentication tokens uh, to critical projects, as was identified through an earlier draft. We expect to do more of that with their updated list. The Alpha Omega project has an alpha side focused specifically to help uh, the most critical projects, and we're expecting to use the data you're going to hear today to help us identify those. If you're interested in more, OpenSSF.org. And with that, hopefully that gives you a little bit of context. So Frank, please take it away. Great. Thanks so much, David. Uh, so as David alluded to, um, we're uh, uh, working with uh, the support of the OpenSSF and uh, the Linux Foundation. We thank them very much for their, uh, for their work. And before we uh, jump in, I do want to just give a, a mention, David mentioned how open source has enabled the world to collaborate. Uh, and I think it's important to note there's uh, there's actually tens of thousands of open source developers in the Ukraine, uh, and of course our hearts go out to them uh, and our thoughts are with them during the, this, this tragic time. Um, and so I also want to thank all the people uh, that were involved in this report. You'll hear from a few of them uh, today during the Q&A session. Uh, but this was a, a, a multi-year effort that involved a lot of people and a lot of stakeholders and a lot of different uh, support. And so we greatly appreciate uh, everyone who contributed. So uh, David mentioned, uh, kind of ended with thinking about open source vulnerabilities, um, where a lot of these efforts started was back in 2014 with the OpenSSL heart lead vulnerability that some of you uh, may remember. Um, certainly, you know, many at the time said this was a, a very bad uh, bug and a very bad vulnerability as it was, uh, but it's unlikely to be the last one that we see. Uh, now, of course, as uh, uh, we all probably have heard of in the more recent times, just a few months ago, the log for J vulnerability and log for shell. Uh, Jen Easterly, the head of, of CISA, uh, said that this was the most serious vulnerability that she's seen in her entire her decades long career, which I think many would agree with. Uh, and even more than that, when we think about how all of this impacts individual companies, uh, we have to keep in mind that even though uh, you know, open source is, is free for being used and it's open and all these wonderful things that we can build upon it, uh, we do have to keep in the back of our minds that when we think about security related to open source, individual companies can be uh, uh, held liable uh, for the results of any breach related to these types of uh, uh, open source packages. So uh, just as an example, shortly after after Log4j and the Log4 shell vulnerability came out, the US FTC said that it would uh, uh, use its full authority against any companies that didn't patch and fix the vulnerability, and that there, that led to customer data being lost. And so this is something that, you know, it, as David alluded to, open source is really in every aspect of our economy now. Uh, and it's becoming more and more uh, uh, obvious that we need to think about what we're working on, what we're building, and how can we secure it, because it affects us all. So uh, David mentioned uh, a little bit of, of uh, uh, the core infrastructure initiative, which was the precursor to the Open Source Security Foundation, OpenSSF. So just to give you a brief timeline, uh, back in 2014, uh, the Linux Foundation set up uh, the CII as a multi-party stakeholder uh, effort to think about what to do about the OpenSSL vulnerability and to start some of the, to lay some of the groundwork for the work that we're doing now. And that included uh, doing what was called at the times the census project, 
object, uh, but now we're referring to as census one because we're doing census two. Uh, and so this was focused on examining the Linux kernel itself and the packages uh, that were critical to the Linux kernel. And so actually David and a number of others uh, ran this first census uh, to identify which software packages in, and they had to pick one. So they looked at the Debian Linux distribution in particular uh, to understand which packages were most critical to the kernel and its operation and security. Now, of course, where they you know, drew the line at the end of census one uh, was the focus on the Linux kernel and the kernel itself. Uh, and obviously open source, even since then, since you know, the past five or six years has become very infused within all software. And so thinking about the open source uh, that's deployed in production applications uh, is where census two is focused. So the goals of census two are really to think about reinforcing the open source infrastructure and guarding against systematic vulnerabilities by un better understanding the following things. So number one, and the, the most you know, critical piece of what we're trying to do here is think about what open source is out there, how much of it is being used and how different dependencies uh, make that maybe behind the scenes that may be hidden in ways that we wouldn't necessarily think about, oh, you know, this piece of open source is something that all developers, lots of developers use, but actually there's pieces of open source that that's built on uh, that are behind the scenes. And so digging deep into these dependencies and the various pieces of open source usage to better understand what's being used and to understand its e uh, impact on the economy and innovation uh, was one of the primary things that we're trying to do here. Uh, related to that, also thinking about a measure of impact. So thinking about, uh, as David mentioned, the, the, the OpenSSF has the, a critical working uh, cr critical projects working group uh, that is, is trying to better understand if we're going to offer support to various open source uh, uh, packages and open source maintainers, where should we start and, and which projects are most critical? Uh, so now our, our hope is to be able to contribute heavily to that conversation. What we've done is not the be all end all of the most critical open source projects. However, certainly an important piece of when we think about criticality is how widely used is a piece of software. And so our goal is to contribute to that conversation. And then some of you may be familiar with our prior efforts uh, related to running a large survey of open source community members. Uh, and so our hope is to use these two uh, uh, efforts uh, in tandem to think about ways that we can better help uh, the, some of the open source uh, uh, contributors and maintainers that may be rather you know, stretched thin, right? Especially when we think about these super widely used open source projects. And then finally, um, when we think about you know, uh, investment and how we, where we go from here and where we go moving forward, uh, the hope is that Census 2 and other OpenSSF uh, projects uh, and research can be used to help prioritize investments and resources uh, to support the security and health of all open source, but we have to start somewhere. And so the hope would be that we can start with some of the most widely used and some of the most critical projects that are out there. Uh, and so when we think about this in particular in the context of what we're gonna be discussing today, um, the real primary objective of this is to better understand which free and open source software packages at the application library level uh, that companies and industries rely on in their daily operations that they're baking into software that they then resell or the software that they rely upon internally, how many instances of each different open source package are there and what upstream and downstream dependencies uh, result from this. And we did this by analyzing data sets on private usage of uh, open source uh, that was provided by um, our three software composition analysis or SEA companies, Sneak, Synopsys, and Fossa. So these companies, if you're not familiar with them, what they do is they uh, work with their clients to identify what open source is in their, uh, their infrastructure, in their products, in their software, uh, to better be able to make sure they're not uh, violating any licenses or to also be able to better secure these things when uh, new vulnerabilities are found. Um, so thankfully, these three companies worked with us um, to contribute data in an anonymized way. And we were able to bring together these, these, uh, uh, all this data um, to better understand, again, what open source is baked in at the application layer um, going into other software that's been being used for other purposes. Uh, and the great thing about working uh, with these three companies by just working with the three of them, we were able to get insight into the use of open source at thousands of companies. And so we, you know, again, as I mentioned, um, this is not the be all end all of open 
source usage, but certainly we have a very wide and a very deep insight into what open source is being used at this particular layer in the stack. Uh, as David mentioned, we issued a preliminary report, what now seems a, a lifetime ago, because it was pre-pandemic, pre-war in Ukraine, pre all these different, pre-Joe Biden presidency, all these different things that have changed since then. Um, but what hasn't changed or what has only become more important is the usage of open source. And so uh, back in, in February 2020, we released a preliminary report that kind of gave uh, some notion of uh, uh, the top 10 lists. Um, that of which now we have a bunch of top 500 lists that I'll be talking about in more detail. Uh, and so this work really builds on that preliminary report. And so I thank all the folks that were involved in the early days in this because they, um, we couldn't have been doing what we're doing now without all of their help. Uh, so what is the open, uh, uh, the report that we're, we're discussing and that was just released this morning? So the primary piece of it is looking at eight rank ordered top 500 lists. And the reason we have eight lists is because, as you all probably know, open source is super complicated and the ecosystem uh, varies a great deal when, in how we think about it. So we did a few different slices and dices of the data to give us better insights into, you know, different ways we can think about what are the most widely used open source. So for example, uh, in particular, we looked at um, you know, version, it's per particular versions of software packages versus thinking of things in a more version agnostic way. We also looked at um, the JavaScript NPM repository separately from the other repositories. This is because JavaScript uh, is, encourages kind of the use of smaller packages and therefore people import more packages. And so just as a function of the programming language and the way it's designed, we have lots of uh, more used packages there. And therefore, if we didn't separate these lists out, JavaScript and NPM would really dominate the whole list in a way that isn't truly representative of what's actually being uh, used out there. And then lastly, I mentioned the, uh, the hidden kind of dependencies within uh, open source. And so we did this again in two kind of cuts. One, we looked at what programmers are actually putting into their code themselves directly. So these direct dependencies. And then we also looked at uh, indirect plus those direct dependencies. And so the indirect ones we can think about, you know, if a programmer says calls a particular library, that library builds on a whole bunch of other libraries. And so those are the indirect dependencies uh, uh, that we included in the more uh, the broader list of how we counted uh, open source packages. So again, you know, uh, un unfortunately, there's no, you know, this is the number one used open source uh, package because we have these kind of eight different lists. But we really think that looking at these and all these different slices and dices allows us to better understand how open source is being used and which mo open source packages are the most widely used on these different dimensions. So the analysis was based on over 500,000 observations of open source usage from 2020. Uh, the report, again, is not a definitive claim of which FOSS packages are most critical, um, but it does represent our best estimate of which of these packages are the most widely used by different applications, again, given the limits of our data. And our hope, and I'll talk about this a little bit at the end, is that this will be an ongoing long-term, uh, you know, yearly or, or uh, every other year type of project. Um, and so we'd love for other folks to contribute as well, because the more people that contribute, the bit more we can see into the entire open source ecosystem, and the more we can think about getting closer to what the ground truth actually is. So a few notes on uh, the methods and just how we did all of this. Uh, so we, we, as I mentioned, we kind of end up with these eight five, top 500 lists. Uh, we did that by from each of the companies that contributed data, taking the top 1,000 uh, packages that showed up in their own analysis, um, and then splitting it on these dimensions that I just mentioned. Uh, and then we did what's called calculating uh, a z-score. So uh, the z-score is thinking, if you think way back to, you know, your, maybe you had a stats class at some point, uh, this is just thinking about where in a distribution uh, a particular observation occurs, right? And so if, you know, it's very high and it's a real outlier on the high side, then this z-score is going to be uh, very high. Um, and, and if it's, you know, it's something that's in the middle, then the z-score will be relatively, you know, moderate, uh, and then it could be much lower than that. And the reason we had to 
do this is because these three companies all have different sizes of com uh, customer bases that they're looking at. And so if, for example, one of them had 10,000 customers and the other only had 1,000 customers, then obviously, you know, if we just added those numbers together, then the one with the 10,000 customers would kind of dominate. But that's not necessarily what, how we wanted to, to aggregate this. So instead, we think about where in the distribution of an individual company's uh, uh, open source usage statistics did this show up? And then we use those numbers to combine them together to think about uh, how high or low on this kind of ranking in the overall distribution any given package was. Uh, and then, you know, we take this, uh, so we have, you know, 3,000 different components potentially, and we whittle this down and, and chopped it off at the top 500. Uh, for a, a variety of reasons, our goal was to be able to share as much information as possible while still respecting the privacy and, and uh, integrity of the data and from our data uh, providers. Uh, so that's how we ended up at these top 500 lists. Um, happy if there are questions about that uh, uh, to chat more about that during the Q&A. Uh, but what I wanted to, to just show, I'm not going to sit here and show you all the, the, the top 500 lists that would take hours and hours and hours, uh, but I'll just give you kind of a teaser of the data, uh, which is, is now available as of the, this morning uh, with the report. Um, and the last thing I'll mention too, and you'll see this in just a moment when I uh, uh, show the, the, the tables, um, is that we also included information on uh, OpenSSF badging. Uh, so uh, David mentioned that one of the, the goals of the OpenSSF is to also help educate and increase the security levels of lots of uh, open source projects. And one of the ways that they're doing that is through the badging program that essentially shows, you know, here's a whole list of best practices that you should be following. Uh, and where do you kind of fit on that? Are you doing, you know, uh, all, are you, as he mentioned, are you using multi-factor authentication on some of the key accounts or are you doing uh, you know security audits and things like that um, so uh, the open source uh, the open SSF badging uh, just to have that in the back of your mind, a hundred, uh, uh, it, it's on a score of 300. 100 means essentially you're passing and you're, you know, at kind of the next level and you're doing all of the basic things. And then you can get up to 300 if you're doing the more advanced things uh, that are certainly uh, highly recommended, um, but aren't necessarily kind of the baseline everybody should be doing this. Uh, and as you'll notice, once I, uh, when I move to the next slide, lots of these open source projects are actually not participating in the badging process. And so certainly one thing that we hope, uh, if nothing, else comes out of this is more awareness about these types of efforts that are it really intended to help open source maintainers and contributors enhance the security of their own or uh, uh, their own projects right and not everybody has to be a security expert however following these kind of baseline uh, best practices really goes a long way to enhancing the overall security of open source so as I mentioned, um, we have a whole bunch of different cuts. I'll kind of show you uh, uh, just the top 10 from each of these eight cuts. Uh, and so here we have um, the, uh, uh, the cuts that are looking at um, direct dependencies. So these are the things that programmers you know, put in their code directly um, across and uh, uh, in a version agnostic way, right? So there's no version information here. Um, and these are uh, on the left is the NPM uh, lists and on the right is the non-NPM, uh, which this list interestingly is, is moderately dominated by Maven, although some of the other cuts of non-NPM are dominated by Go and other programming languages as well. And so again, this z-score really kind of helps us uh, think about the relative ranking of these. So not only, you know, if we look at the NPM for a second, not only is Lodash number one, uh, but it's, you know, nearly twice as, as widely used in a variety of ways uh, than number two is, right? So we not only have this kind of rank ordered list, but we have some sense of the difference in and the jump from one uh, project to the next, right? Uh, and so obviously, you know, again, we can see uh, some of these uh, uh, packages are using the badging and are, you know, on their way. Some are, are higher than, than others in terms of their, uh, uh, the, 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 how high they are in their tiered percentage. Um, but at the same time, lots of these projects are not uh, using the badges. Um, and so obviously, you know, Log4j has been on everybody's mind. Um, I will point out, you know, there's, there's a number of letters here that are, are similar to, to Log4j in the number one package that showed up uh, on the non-MPM. Uh, that SFL, uh, SLF4j is a lay API that can 
call multiple logging packages, including log4j. And so I think these are the types of things that it's important to think about in the future uh, as we think about where we should be spending our, our security dollars and our efforts in thinking about prioritizing uh, where, uh, uh, you know, which projects are very widely used. Uh, just a, another, you know, brief teaser when we think about the indirect and the direct and combining these kind of hidden dependencies that are higher up the, 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 the chain. Uh, obviously, we see, we see different, uh, different lists here. And so that's interesting because, again, when we think about the most widely used open source, often uh, developers, if you, you know, survey them, would say one thing, but what actually is behind the scenes is something that, that is quite different, right? And so we don't, um, you know, we don't, uh, we don't even show, see Lodash here, which was number one on the, the NPM direct list showing up in the top 10. It is on you know, the top, I believe, 100, uh, and it shows up a little further down. But at the same time, uh, it gives us a different kind of insight into what's going on with uh, open source usage. Uh, just one more cut, and I'll you know, stop throwing these eye charts up after one more, um, thinking about uh, versioned packages. And so here we also included information about individual versions of packages. Um, and this really allows us to better understand kind of how, uh, uh, how old the software is uh, that people are using, right? One of the more fascinating things that, we, that, that came through in, in this analysis, analysis in particular is that actually uh, a lot of people using log4j were using the 1.x series rather than the 2.x series, uh, which was the 2.x series was where uh, the big the log4 shell vulnerability was found. And so interestingly enough, lots of people, at least in this data set, weren't necessarily uh, susceptible to that log4j issue because they hadn't updated their software in a long time. I wouldn't recommend that as a defense mechanism, certainly. Um, the, the log4j version 1.x was last updated in 2015. And there's actually been a number of vulnerabilities discovered uh, in it since then. And so by no means were those people secure from, from everything. However, interestingly, uh, they, were, they weren't necessarily affected by uh, the most recent log4j issue that um, you know, was in the news over the past few months. Uh, and then lastly, uh, this, this, this final list is, is just, a, again, another cut thinking about the indirect and direct dependencies, again, at the version level. Uh, and so you can read the report for uh, more insights and for the all eight of these top 500 lists, um, both at the version and the unversion level and with these other different cuts. All right, um, so uh, now pulling back to, to the higher level, we wanted to think a little bit about uh, lessons learned and where, and where we can go from here. So at the highest level, um, you know, we highlight the need for standardized naming schema for software components. One of the things that was certainly tricky on the back end, merging all this, this data and bringing these all, all these things together is that there are lots of packages named debug. Uh, or lots of packages named XYZ, right? And so when we think about these efforts to better understand open source usage, uh, there is no kind of true naming scheme that everybody has to follow. Different companies use different schemes, different open source projects use different, uh, uh, different methods. And so thinking about that is something that um, was you know, noticeably important at the higher level. And related to that, there's also a lot of complexities associated with package versions. In particular, we saw um, some versions uh, reported by our data partners that were widely used pieces of software uh, that didn't actually exist in the public repositories for those packages. Uh, our speculation is that what's happening here is there's been internal forks by company and the companies and they maintain internal versions of individual packages and have their own sort of versioning system. Now that's certainly, you know, depending on the license and the, the David ran through a number of the licenses before, depending on which license that they're using, that's that could be totally fine from a kind of legality standpoint. But when we start thinking about software bill of materials and the ability to actually track, you know, what version of a piece of open source is in my, uh, you know, in my code, that that can make things a lot more complicated because then different version numbers can mean different things and it makes it harder for, for companies to understand, am I vulnerable to you know, whatever the new vulnerability that just came out was. Uh, third, we talked about, uh, we thought a lot about um, the, uh, how many people are actually contributing to the different open source packages. Uh, so, and for an example, in just one of the, the top 500 lists, looking at just the top 50 packages in that list, 
uh, only 136 developers were responsible for more than 80% of the lines of code added in the last year. Uh, and so when we think about, you know, this, this kind of many eyes and lots of people working on open source, that may be true in aggregate, but on any given project, often we see one or maybe two developers contributing the, the bulk of the code. And this makes things more complicated when we think about uh, security because uh, there's a lot that needs to be done. Uh, and then we think about the notion that uh, those people are stretched pretty thin already. Uh, fourth, we thought about uh, the increasing importance of an individual developer account security. So here we had, uh, we noticed that lots of these very popular packages are hosted under individual accounts on GitHub or other repositories. Uh, and that can be concerning because those don't have the same level of security uh, as organizational accounts or some other types of things. So David already alluded to the fact that um, the OpenSSF has been uh, working with many of these uh, uh, projects to, to give them multi factor authentication tokens and the ability to increase just the baseline level of security on their accounts. And then finally, from the high level, uh, this persistence of legacy software in, in open source. I, I just mentioned this issue with uh, Log4j. Um, and, and that was with, uh, we saw that with lots of uh, different packages, right? The very old versions were still being relied upon heavily. Uh, and this is a problem that is, is in all sorts of software, right? Not just open source, but is something that needs to be thought about in the context of open source moving forward as well. So our hope is that this report spurs a number of different types of, of actions. Um, the, uh, uh, I'll just mention three. The first is data sharing. Obviously, again, we had to we worked with private companies to get access to this great data. We hope more are willing to join future efforts because this is really where uh, the best data and best insights are coming from about open source usage. Um, we can get some kind of tip of the iceberg from public repositories, but really we need this behind the scenes type of data to better understand what's being used in practice. Second, thinking about coordination. I talked about uh, the naming and the versioning concerns. As the world moves more to uh, rely on software bill of materials, which is, which is a fantastic thing on many dimensions, this naming and versioning issue will probably continue to be a bigger deal. And so thinking about how we're going to uh, account for these different names and different versions is going to be something that I think will be important as we come to rely on uh, software bill of materials. And then finally, um, thinking about spurring action and thinking about investment, right? And so this is a big thing that we've seen even from when our preliminary report came out in 2020 that's changed over time. There's been some more funding for research and thinking about how we actually understand uh, what's going on in the open source ecosystem, which is great. Uh, and then even more recently, especially coming out of the meeting at the White House uh, related to Log4j and open source security in general and the efforts of the open SSF, uh, we're seeing more and more investment. Uh, David mentioned the Alpha Omega project. This is the one I'm referencing here. Um, where individual companies are sponsoring these types of projects to help fix all of the open source uh, uh, that they rely on, but also that the world relies heavily on. All right, um, so with that, I'm going to turn things over uh, to Jessica, um, because Jessica is going to give us some insights into thinking about how individual companies can take this type of data and help them use, uh, uh, you know, ensure their, uh, secure their own ecosystems. All right, thank you, Frank. I'd like to thank the Linux Foundation for inviting me to join in today's discussion and begin by saying these are my own opinions as someone who's led Linux and open source software engineering teams and having been a part of the open source software ecosystem for the past 15 years. I'd also like to thank the team at Harvard who has done this research. You know, this means that every company who's trying to develop you know, similar lists of open source packages and their software linkages and dependencies, you know, we don't have to try and replicate this work on our own. You know, this is a, a great example of how we can work collaboratively, you know, as a part of a community by leveraging the strength of the ecosystem to create it once and use it many times with, within members of that ecosystem. So, you know, this research is definitely a step in the right direction. There is more work for each of us to do, but this is a, a really solid foundation based on data that companies can build upon. Now, 
If your company or your company's products leverage open source software, you need to contribute to those communities and the health of the ecosystem. You know, this includes the understanding of the health of a project or community and the risks associated with using the code. Now, now companies are, are going to be in different points in their open source journey, you know, but security, no matter where you're at on that continuum, you know, security needs to be top of mind. It cannot be an afterthought. And as, as David mentioned earlier in the discussion, you know, no software is perfect. And even though open source has the opportunity to have more eyes looking at it, it does not mean that it is inherently more secure. There is work that must be done to create secure software and open communities, just the same as there's work to secure proprietary software products. So, you know, this research report develops awareness of the potential issues. Now, companies who use this software need to develop their own action plans. So this list should be used by companies to develop a risk assessment of their open source software. Now, many companies are currently looking at the open source software they consume, um, that their customers consume, and how to mitigate any risks associated using that open source software. I'd like to share a few best practices that companies can use to help develop their plans on what to do next. So now the first best practice is, is just kind of what I began with, right? Companies should be contributing their time, their talent and their support to the open source projects and communities that they're directly benefiting from. The times of being a passive, you know, consumer of open source software, you know, that, that time has passed. You know, taking the, the free puppy analogy, when I rescued my two dogs from my local animal shelter four years ago, it was during a clear the shelter event where adoptions were free. So, you know, essentially, you know, this was a, these were free puppies, but as any pet owner or parent knows, I've spent thousands of dollars on my dog since that time over the years because you know, pet ownership is filled with great responsibilities, um, as well as, you know, great things like companionship, right, and joy. I, I fully accept that, um, you know, having my dogs comes with responsibilities, like feeding them, you know, two times a day, uh, grooming them every six weeks, taking them to the vet, you know, walking them daily. Expanding that analogy to open source software if you're experiencing the joy of open source software, you also need to take on the responsibility to improve the code base and remediate issues in open source um, if they arise. Now, the, the second best practice is knowing what you are shipping within your own products with a software bill of materials. Now, when a, a company is manufacturing a piece of hardware, um, for example, a, a compute server, having an accurate bill of materials is essential. You know, it ensures that all parts are available. Um, it ensures that the manufacturing process is not gonna be interrupted if you have to locate a missing or out of stock part. It includes the, the name of the part, who produces it, how many parts do you need? Which does, which, uh, you know, what does each part cost? If, if, if there's an alternate part that can be used in its place, right? It, it covers all the bases. Now we would never design a system, um, a hardware system without a, a bill of materials. It, it's, it's a recipe for success. Now this really, you know, we, we have the same need with software, right? Software companies, should have a software bill of materials when building complex software systems. And, and let's be real, you know, every, every software system is complex, right? With all the kind of the interdependencies we have, you know, built throughout the, you know, our code base and ecosystem. So, you know, as a, a software bill of materials is gonna provide that transparency of components delivered within the software supply chain and ecosystem. And, and learning more about that and, and having one is a great place for organization and companies to start 
um, who want to strengthen their software security. Now, that, this is going to bring me to my third best practice, which is to enable your open source engineering teams with consistent and strong, you know, tops down focus, as well as bottoms up enablement on the importance of secure software practices and policies. Now, this includes, um, you know, best practice that, that I've been directly involved with is, is having core teams of engineers and practitioners who specialize in security available to consult with your, your open source product teams um, to make sure that they understand that they're following the best practices and the, the correct tooling, right? It all begins with awareness and education. It also includes, you know, seeking out training um, as well as tools and expertise to raise your company's awareness of what steps can be taken to mitigate risks. Now, as David mentioned earlier, you know, everyone is free to participate in the open SSF community um, initiatives um, and can take advantage of free training, webinars on best practices, as well as accesses, access to tools to help as, uh, assess and mitigate risks. Now, the next step for us as members of companies that benefit from open source software um, is to make this a priority, right? Th these are not someone else's problems to solve, right? We need to accept that as a collective. And, you know, we need to accept that we're going to have to be a part of the solution. So there's tools, there's education and an ecosystem to help support us to solve these problems. We have to come together and make this a priority. It's, it's really time for us to, to get to work. So I know we've um, allocated some time for, for Q&A. Um, so I think we can go ahead and shift to that now. Great, thanks so, so much, Jessica. And I think it's, it's so important to me to have this, this kind of corporate uh, or company-based opinion because I, or, or perspective, because I think that you know, we, we as academics tend to get super into the, the weeds and into the data and, and have lots of fun with that. Um, but you know, again, our, our hope with this whole project has been to give guidance to uh, kind of three buckets of, of, of folks, right? One are organizations like the OpenSSF or even governments that are trying to you know, think about of this at the high level. The, other, the second is really to, to companies themselves and thinking about how they use open source, how they can support it, where they should go from here. And the third is even uh, uh, the open source contributors and maintainers themselves to think about you know, how they appear on these lists. And, and you know, I, I, frankly, I'm sure that, that some, some of these open source uh, you know, packages that have ended up on these lists will actually be a surprise to some of the maintainers that their packages are that widely used, right? Um, and these are exactly the types of things that you know we're, we're from the, the company perspective I think it's very important to understand you know how companies can utilize this type of information um, so thanks so much um, so yeah so now we'll open up for, for Q&A um, we have a, a couple of questions that have already uh, been put in the, the, the Q&A um, zoom uh, function please feel free to keep those coming and we'll answer them as they uh, they come in uh, David I think you were going to answer one of those first yeah time. yeah so let me let me answer uh, the first one I see um, uh, from uh, Thomas Frick, who mentioned that uh, the German government has developed something, uh, sovereigntechfund.de uh, slash e en for the English version, I assume, uh, about the uh, German government wanting to invest in open source security and wanting to connect with the open SSF. Uh, delighted. Um, you know, uh, absolutely. Um, as we mentioned earlier, if you want to work within with the open SSF to improve open source security, uh, please join and so on. But if you want to talk about, hey, either funding the open SSF or coordinating efforts in some way, probably the, the quick, easy way to start is just send, shoot an email to Brian Bellendorf uh, and myself, David A. Wheeler. Uh, that's, um, I'll, I'll post our emails uh, in the chat. Uh, we're not hard, hard to find. And we, we'd be delighted to you know work with, coordinate, if you've got funding and you want to chat with us about how, how to fund some things, um, happy, happy to do all of those things. So, <clears throat> so yep, yeah, please contact us. We'd love to chat with you. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, Frank, you want to take the next one? Yeah, I'll take uh, uh, Lawrence Hecht uh, asked, can we agree that the naming scheme 
uh, can be dealt with or it can be dealt with in the SBOM discussions. Um, so uh, I, I think the answer is yes, um, but we have to make sure that it is, right? And so both uh, the naming uh, uh, concerns that we had, for example, that you know there's there's 15 different debug packages, and sometimes there's in in the same language, uh, you know there can be different packages with the same or very you know, very similar names, um, and then also with the version issues that you mentioned as well. Uh, I think so. I think the answer, to Lawrence, to your, your question is is yes, uh, we can do that, but we have to make sure that we do it because um, and so agreeing on you know as as kind of a community, uh, for example example, how should we think about the canonical name of a package, right? Should it be, um, you know, a package manager plus the name, or should it be something like a URL, either on, uh, you know, a repository like GitHub or GitLab or something like that, or a, a separate uh, URL? I think these are, are all reasonable options, um, but I think that's some of the things that the folks at NTIA and Commer Department of Commerce and, and those um, working on the SBOMs now uh, uh, and the, the language for you know the suggestions around them um, are thinking about at this point. So my hope is that the answer is yes, um, but I think it has to be a, a uh, you know a, uh, um, a, a, on a decision on purpose to try to address those. David, did you want to? Follow yeah, up? I just want to. Well, I, I I definitely agree that this is something that uh, needs to be work, dealt with within the uh, communities developing SBOM specifications and related things. Um, I, I'm already on record saying that I think URLs have to be at least part of the solution, in part because, you know, hey, everybody downloads from Maven. No, they do not. Uh, there is a huge number of, say, internal to organization repos. Uh, system packages are often modified and tweaked by various system org. So, you know, version foo 1.2.3 from, say, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is not necessarily the same as the source code of foo 1.2.3 from its original developers. And so, um, you know, this is why the name naming is actually more complex than it see seems at first at first blush. And so we need to uh, have ways that can handle widely distributed uh, distribution systems. Thanks. All right, we, we have a question from Denton on how to best promote getting an open source coordinator position at all universities and asking where we can collaborate on software, uh, where they can collaborate on software security and university needs. And so, you know, my answer to you, and I know there are some other questions in the chat that are somewhat similar is, never let a good crisis go to waste, right? So Log4j has captured the attention of not just the, you know, kind of people who work in IT, it is something that has permeated governments and, you know, business people, it's gotten that awareness. And so I think what, what you should do is work with your administration and, and kind of put together the business case on how, you know, important having this CISO type function um, as a part of the of a community of a of a university community, and um, you know, just you know, we really it's not something you can kind of afford not to do, right? So again, my my advice is to not let this uh, crisis go to waste. Yeah, it sounds like they're talking about something like an open source program office, an OSPO, or something similar. Um, you know, there's actually a whole bunch of, if you just Google that, uh, you know, you do, do use a search, you'll find a whole bunch of things about doing those. I think in an academic session, sec, um, situation, it's a little more complicated. Um, I think that it's probably more easily done in a more distributed, lower level way instead of necessarily trying to do it at the university level. But really, I mean, I think the key there is, is you, know, you know, don't let a good crisis go to waste. You know, hey, there's some challenges. Let's make things better, and focusing on that, and then tweaking things based on your specific circumstance. And I'll, I'll add to that. I know that uh, John Hops, Johns Hopkins University has actually been doing a lot of work on on building out an OSPO and things like that. And they've been, um, I forget the name of the, the person in charge, but they've been uh, publishing some blogs and some kind of best practices for how universities can think about building an OSPO. Um, so I'd check that that out as well. Um, uh, so there was a question about um, kind of where we're going from here um, and what's, uh, uh, you know, what's next on the radar for, for this type of, of effort. Stephen, I don't know if you want to maybe answer that one. 
Yeah, sure. Ha happy to. Um, yeah, so I think what we want to do is we want to continue to build on these efforts and move into understanding um, OSS in the cloud. Uh, but also, you know, we're, we're an academic institution, so we like to run experiments. We have uh, quite a few uh, eager economists on staff who love to run experiments. So I think we're going to run some experiments on um, the, the value of open source, both on the, the, to the um, developers, but also to, the, um, to, to uh, uh, industry as well. Um, and then we're, I think we're also going to uh, look back and, uh, you know, we, we released a report, um, I want to say September 2020, on um, the community contributions to uh, OSS. And so I think we may circle back around there. Um, but much on the horizon, I think, uh, in terms of uh, building on this, um, building on this data in this, uh, this report. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, and then, Yano, there was a question about um, where did it go? Uh, uh, Javier is asking uh, if we could be, it would be interesting to see the breakdown of this data uh, by regions um, to think about uh, contributions coming from different regions and if there's uh, specific uh, areas geographically that may need more help uh, uh, than others. Sure, sure, happy to answer. So um, I think for this question, just as Frank mentioned in the, in the discussion before, like uh, we have some kind of the privacy um, concerns from the data at the data provider standpoint. So um, at this time, we're actually not able to provide that level of insight, but um, I think this is actually something we wanna do in the future. And then uh, with more data sharing and then also some potential more ne negotiations coming out, um, maybe this is something we can do in the future. Great, thanks. Uh, let's see, working our way through the questions. Um, Do I have to take the uh, question from Benjamin Bukhari? Yeah, great. That'd be great. All right. So, best practices for medium, uh, small to medium sized businesses to best maintain their open source software dependency graphs. Uh, they don't have the resources to track that information. Um, I mean, if, if you're developing software, I think the first step is trying to use the tools that are already there, maximally automating. In particular, um, there are still developers who think that the good way to add their dependencies is by copying and pasting some random version of the code. Don't do that. Use a package manager. It's what they're for. You know, package managers exist to automatically manage your dependencies. Now, um, you know, there's a lot of tools that once you start using automated tools, you know, particularly package managers, they can take that information and generate uh, software build materials that work across uh, different ecosystems. Uh, excuse me. Um, the, the next step would be starting to encourage your suppliers to provide software bill of materials. Uh, you know, because you know, I, and and right now that's an effort that's ongoing. The U.S. government is already um, pressing on that particular um, gas pedal, uh, and I'm sure there's going to be others. Uh, there's um, already work. Of the I mean, you know, it's been a long time coming. But for example, the SPDX was only finally an ISO standard what last year. So you know, it's you know, it, it's one of those things where a lot of people have agreed this is something that needs doing, but things are only recently coming to fruition um so but, but i think the things i just listed i think are a good step in that direction great um and then we're just kind of going uh alpha, or nu numerically here um uh or david were you gonna so the uh, kathy kathy asked a question kathy giori asked a question about um best practices of uh, how to organize uh, lists of open source internally, I think, um, so they can easily, more easily support being part of ongoing census efforts like this um, without so much manual effort to analyze the data. Uh, so I, I can speak for you know uh, myself and Yano and Stephen. Uh, yes, there was a lot of manual analyzing of the data on our part, but also on the parts of the SCAs um, to you know ensure the privacy and and you know that they weren't revealing anything um, you know sensitive about their customers. Um, when they were providing this, hence the, the geography uh, concern that Yano mentioned. 
Um, and so one of the things that we're, we're thinking about doing in the future um, is, is trying to do exactly that. So, so trying to make it easier for individual companies that uh, have insights into their own operation, um, but not necessarily like the SEA's insights into many operations to be able to contribute data to um, this type of you know, future census efforts. Um, so unfortunately, the only real answer I have for you, Kathy, is, is stay tuned. Um, but um, we are hoping that in future versions of this, either when we uh, uh, run uh, um, kind of censuses based on surveys, so more like the, you know, the census, the way we think about it, run at the government level, um, or censuses based on, uh, um, you know, more technical means with kind of the SEA partners and things like that. Um, certainly, Kathy, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my, uh, uh, I'll put my email in the, the chat for uh, anybody that wants to reach out that's interested in contributing to uh, future efforts around this. Yeah, if I could quickly add, the, the problem wasn't organizing the data, it was uh, getting access to the data. Um, so you know, that's really the thing that we'd like, we would love to have more folks being willing to share. Thanks. Yes, agreed. Uh, the next question is from Blake. Uh, why is there uh, a focus on differentiating NPM versus non-NPM? Um, this is, we give a little more detail in the report on why we do that, but in particular, NPM packages tend to be much smaller than, and, and have fewer functions uh, than other types of packages. And therefore, you know, in an average uh, JavaScript, which is, is, you know, what NPM uh, predominantly hosts um, type of a program, you end up importing a whole bunch of packages. And so that en ends up making it look like like when we aggregate this all together, that NPM is, is really dominating the entire ecosystem, but really it's just more of a function of the way that uh, the, you know, the, their kind of norms and the way that the coding is done. Um, and so it's, it's not anything to do with kind of back end or front end. It's more about just the way that um, the size of the packages and the number of functions. And so if we had combined everything together, NPM and, and JavaScript would have dominated everything because of that. And that would have kind of hidden a lot of useful information coming from other types of packages and languages and things like that. A uh, quick stat, about half of all the NPM packages have zero or one functions. <laughs> There we go. Okay, <laughs> it's it's uh, it, it's quite a spectacular difference. And that makes it that that's why these are separated. Excellent. Uh, let's see. Uh, Aster. Hello, Aster. Good to good to hear from you. Thanks for, for your question. Um, uh, is there a coordinated effort between OpenSSF to reach out to engage with international stakeholders, uh, such as other governments, uh, but also currently less engaged industry verticals, uh, etc.? Um, I can give a, a bit of an answer to that. David, you may be able to give a bit more detail um, given your role. Um, so the, I, I think the answer is yes, they're moving in that direction. Um, certainly it's, it's um, you know, there have been focused more on businesses at the moment as opposed to governments. But I think given uh, where many governments are headed and, you know, I, the EU I think in, is, is uh, uh, often a bit ahead of the US on this type of game. So um, I'll let David uh, add on to that though, because I think he may have more. Yeah, the, the openness SSF actually does have a public policy subcommittee, um, but it's been more of an a, a, you know, industry trying to you know answer questions from various governments. But yeah, uh, this in my you know the security of open source software is important for society writ large, industry, government, everybody. So this is an area where public private partnerships are absolutely the right idea. Uh, so we'd love your help in making that happen. Absolutely. Uh, I will note that it's almost the top of the hour. Um, we're happy. There's a few more questions. We're happy to stick around um, and uh, uh, and um, answer them. Uh, uh, just to you know, make sure everybody gets an answer if if, if we can answer them. Um, but uh, the report went live today. Um, I believe the the link went out in the chat. Please feel free um, to check it out. And uh, again, for folks that are interested in um, either uh, joining the census effort in particular or future census efforts, please feel free re to reach out to us. And certainly, if you're interested in uh, joining the OpenSSF um, and the, or, or in the other efforts um, uh, around the Linux Foundation, um, feel free to reach out to us as well. Um, because I, I think personally, one of the things that's so fascinating about this whole, you know, 
uh, open source ecosystem and the problems that we're trying to face is that, you know, by design, this is all very decentralized and distributed. And that can be a good thing from the, you know, kind of the, the, the support and the productivity standpoint, but it actually can make these types of issues harder to solve. And really, it's only going to be by everyone coming together and working on these problems in aggregate um, from, you know, nonprofits like the Linux Foundation, companies like IBM, academics, governments, you know, all these types of folks uh, that we're really going to be able to, you know, fix this and ensure that open source continues to play the vital role uh, that it has been playing for decades to come. All right, so thank you all very much. We'll stick around and answer a few more questions, but please feel free uh, to, uh, to log on. And thanks also to our, our uh, panelists, because it's been great to have you all here. Uh, let's see, um, what other questions? David, do you, do you know about the Perl standard? I'm not- Yes. Okay. Yes, I, yes. All right. So, yeah, that that's an effort to uh, deal with package naming. Um, I mean, right, I don't want to beat up really on the on on the Perl specification because uh, too much here because if there's you know if there's a shortcoming, the correct solution is to uh, send an issue to the Perl specification folks and say, hey, you're missing. Um, that said, I mean, you asked the question, so uh, let me one one in particular weakness of the Perl specification um, is that it can't handle version ranges. Um, and that's really important when you want to have a, I got a vulnerability, what does it apply to? Um, <clears throat> so I think that's, that's an area where it, there's a weakness, it needs to be adjusted. Um, whether or not it's a weakness or not, I think it's important to understand that it's really focusing on built packages, not necessarily source. There's a number of projects where really you download and, and deal with the source code directly. That's not really what's designed for, but it's a reality. Um, but you know, I don't want to beat up too much on 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 Perl. Really, uh, the the Perl spec. Um, uh, I, I think the correct answer for weaknesses in it is go talk with the folks who are actually trying to do the work and try to give them a hand. Great. Um, uh, so Thomas Frick uh, asked about um, or mentioned that the German government is interested in building an OSPO as well. And I think this is, again, something we're seeing more and more interest in it. All these companies, universities, governments. Um, I will say that um, the recent, uh, I guess it came out, uh, I think it was last summer, um, European Commission report uh, uh, commissioned by, by the European Commission and done by Open Forum Europe. Uh, had a number of suggestions related to OSPOs at the, the government level. Uh, and so I would encourage you to check that out. Um, uh, I can't, I'll try to find the link uh, while we're answering other questions, but um, there have been a number of uh, suggestions of how government level OSPOs can, can be formed. Uh, and I think too, there, there's kind of two functions that at that level they'll start to play. One is just to organize the open source that the government relies on itself. And then the other is to think about uh, how the government can support industry activities and individual activities uh, related to open source. And so I think um, that report from Open Forum Europe uh, and the European Commission has a number of ways to think about, you know, how the government can sponsor OSPOs that are for themselves and kind of internal purposes versus also kind of sponsoring them for individual industries to, to help out um, with, uh, uh, with um, organizing the industry level, um, you know, open source usage. Yeah, and uh, Sirhat had a question, I hope I'm saying his name, uh, saying the name correctly, about how do we um, encourage companies who are benefiting from open source to actively fund projects, and he had some, um, he had some, you know, kind of ideas that that he shared. So my experience is, you know, I can't make someone do something, right? I I can only change my own behavior. I can't change other people's behaviors. That's you know, after years of therapy, right? So um, what? I, th I think what you have to do, what companies have to realize is what are the implications? Um, there, are, there are financial implications of not um, using secure software. There's um, implications of, you know, how you are seen by your customers, by, you know, the media, you know, the, you know, no customer, no company wants to be on the front page of the newspaper, right, that you, you know, you had this breach or this, this security problem. So I, again, kind of going back to you know, you have to tend your own garden, right? You have to 
companies have to, you know, take ownership of this. And, and it all starts with awareness, right? And so this, re this research, this report starts that awareness as companies become more aware of, of some of the, uh, you know, of, of what they should do, you know, the, the, and, you know, here are some processes and tools and education that you can use. You know, I have full belief that companies will engage, right? But again, they have to come to that realization. Um, you know, it all starts with awareness. Yeah, if, if I could riff a little bit on what Jessica yeah. said, I agree with you that it all starts with awareness. And I do think this report helps. I think another one, interestingly enough, is those is the S-bombs. Uh, I showed that uh, XKZD cartoon of, you know, here's my amazing infrastructure and here's the component that's in trouble that I don't know about. Um, right. I think I think things like S-bombs are actually going to help projects uh, notice, um, I think, increasingly, um, you know, it users, particularly large end users, which have really critical needs, are starting to ask, what's in this software? They start taking a look, you know, I, yes, I'm glad I want this functionality. What's in there? Let me ask some questions. You know, yeah. uh, tell me about the risks. And very, very quickly, they realize, oh, wait, this stuff's great. This one, no problems. What the heck? Um, and so I, I think the short answer is we're the work that's ongoing right now to help provide the visibility will help uh, incentivize folks to to improve things because you know different companies depend on different things, different other organizations depend on different things. So they should care about what matters to them. We need to give them more visibility into what they're uh, depending on. Agreed. Uh, let's see. Uh... Uh, our friend Jim Zemlin uh, mentioned that uh, the Linux Foundation is is actually um, providing free training for governments, uh, government OSPOs through the to-do group uh, that was mentioned before. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's happening yet, but it, it will be uh, likely something that's on the, the very near horizon um, because indeed, you know, they're just like any large organization, they're heavily reliant on open source and, um, but not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, don't have experience trying to think about how to manage this uh, at the, you know, kind of the, the full organization level. So uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Jim. Um, uh, let's see, so, and there was a question um, from Holger uh, Stridel on um, thinking about uh, uh, sources of error um, from the, the SCAs. Um, and uh, uh, maybe Yano, you can uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, that. Yeah, yeah, sure, definitely. So I um, think it's, uh, we try to actually be as clear as possible in our report, um, which is just a link uh, we send it to you. And then in that in the message section, we uh, try to be clear about the assumptions we've made and uh, what kind of data we had, um, what, how we're dealing with different kinds of situations out there. So feel free to check the report, but um, I would say here, like what we're doing is more like uh, matching those, the, the standard where we're referring to is more like the libraries.io's website. So they have a, a, a good kind of, they, they've done a great job in terms of recording those kind of software and components so that um, we're trying to follow that standard. And actually that covered a lot of, most of the, kind of the packages um, that we have in the raw data. So, um, but feel free to reach out if you have any more questions after reading the report. Great, thanks, Yano. Um, there's one last question about uh, regul regulatory requirements for ISV um, to disclose scores or badges for compliance. David, do you have insight into that? Uh, sure. Well, unfortunately, um, uh, the world of governments, I presume this is where this is coming from, uh, love to live with acronyms, but we don't always uh, have the same expansions. I'm assuming what they mean is independent software vendors, uh, but I'll bet there's 300 different expansions of that that might be applicable. But you know what, regardless of that, let's, um, you know, regulatory uh, requirements to disclose scores, badges for compliances. 
Um, I mean, frankly, regulatory requirements, you, we're the wrong people to ask. That's a question to governments. You know, governments are the ones who establish regulatory requirements. Um, so I don't, I can't speak for various governments around the world. Um, I think that I, I would be unsurprised long term if there would be some regulatory requirements. But I, I think that there's always a risk. And I used to work with uh, with uh, the U.S. government a bit, um, quite a bit. Um, I think the risks for anything that comes from governments is, of course, you know, they're trying to come up with criteria, but they're not directly in an industry there. Um, it's often hard to make them accurate and correct and handle all cases. It's hard to make adjustments. And so really, I think as much as possible, industry should try to develop, you know, scoring badges and so on themselves because they have the same problems and can be a whole lot more uh, both nimbler and they're directly involved so they can uh, see it. So um, I think really governments should try, uh, you know, um, could, would, might governments do it? Absolutely, and governments have every right to to do do whatever make you know do whatever it is within their laws that they choose to do, but I I think where possible industry should you know develop those ahead of time so that the governments don't have to try to do that, and then of course if it turns out the the industry creates something that's well that works out well. Um, I mean, there are some things that already exist, and then governments say, hey, that's good. Let's keep doing more of that. Uh, I think that's often a better outcome. Great. Um, yeah, and I would tend to agree. I, I, there's, there's, those are the types of things that, um, you know, some folks are, are talking about being baked in. And, and I think it's, it's kind of, I, I would tend to agree that if, if, the industry can can make that happen itself. That's probably more uh, efficient, but um, but that it may that may come down the the, the line at some point um, as we see you know governments get more heavily involved in uh, uh, in thinking about the role of open source within their own uh, uh, economies. Um, yeah, in fact, if I can jump in further, I, you know, I, I've seen some of the proposed things and some recommendations, and already I'm seeing the, we assume all software developers use waterfall approaches, that everything is, we first write a thousand, a, a 10,000 page contract with all the requirements, so we make sure you follow the 10,000 page requirement. Um, and, oh, we assume that all software developers are very large enterprises, and then they're shocked shocked when it turns out that their assumptions are just not true. Um, it's not because government people are stupid. They're not. But, you know, you know, um, you know, they're working in a different sphere. So I, I, I think that it's better if we, if we try to make it so that governments, you know, either don't have to regulate or their regulations can build on things that have already received widespread consensus by the folks who have to deal with it day in, day out. Agreed. 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 All right. I think we managed to make it through all the questions. So um, thanks to those who stuck around. Uh, thanks to our panelists. I know Jessica had to drop off a little bit early, um, but uh, we really appreciate everyone attending. Hope you uh, enjoy or get get learn from the reports probably more than enjoy. Um, but thanks all for taking the time. Uh, with that, we'll hand it back to uh, Marisa to close us out. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Frank, David, Jessica, Stephen, and Yano for your time today. And thank you again to everyone for joining us. Just a final quick reminder that this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. So we hope you will join us for some future webinars. Have a wonderful day.